When you think about the desert, plants aren't necessarily the first thing that come to mind. For me, it's the epic, expansive stretches of sand, the hot, hot heat, and frankly, I get thirsty just thinking about desert life. Every time I used to tour in Arizona or more desert conditions, I'd always just be thirsty and stressed about water. But then when you stop and really think about the desert, the very specific vegetation hardy enough to survive pops into mind. The towering saguaros, the rosette aloes and agaves, the pollinators flitting between prickly pear flowers. The desert is a planty vibe within itself and requires a specific set of skills and knowledge to tend to your landscape that us non-desert dwelling folk just don't understand and never have to think about. So today's episode is dedicated to all of our desert dwellers or desert dreamers as we dive into how to have a thriving desert landscape of your dreams. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Thank you so much to everyone who has filled out the listener survey so far. You still have one week to fill it out and enter the giveaway with $2,000 worth of prizes, but I am so thankful that you took the time to fill out the survey because I've gotten to know you guys so much better. It's been so eye-opening to see what our community as a whole is how it is represented, and also what you want. I'm hearing pest control episodes. I'm hearing houseplant deep dives. I'm hearing gardening. I hear you. I hear you with the feedback you've given me in the survey, and I can't wait to continue making content. I'm so excited about today's episode because I recorded it last year. I recorded it in September in person at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. I was there for work, and multiple people reached out to me when they saw that I was in Phoenix on social media and said that I had to make it to the Desert Botanical Garden, and that's when I turned into a like chaotic Tasmanian devil, emailing every email I could get, <laughs> calling every line they had to see if someone would pick up and if I could get them to squeeze me in for a visit and an interview about the incredible specimens that they have on site. And I was in such luck that the senior director of horticulture, Tina Wilson, was available to chat with me about all all things desert landscaping, southwestern landscaping, we're kind of using them interchangeably. So today's episode is geared for you plant parents in the southwest garden zones that are looking to find heat-tolerant, drought-resistant plants to create a lush oasis. Because you can create a lush oasis in these conditions, you just need to understand the right plants to use. In case you were curious, the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix is absolutely incredible. Oh my God, it took my breath away when I walked in there. It's one of only 24 botanical gardens accredited by the American Alliance of Museums. And it is home to 4,482 species in the living collection and 485 rare and endangered species of plants under garden care. It's also rooted in education. It has a ton of adult and children education programs, as well as serving as a global leader in the research and conservation of desert plants and their habitats. If you are in the Phoenix area, you must visit this garden. It's totally worth it. The gift shop was also really, really good. I also wanted to give a shout out to a new plant friend I made in Phoenix. She goes on Instagram by the title Chani Gray Home. Her name is Chantel. She has an amazing Instagram account and she is such a sweetheart. We connected via DMs when I was in Phoenix. She's who recommend one of the people who recommended the botanical garden. And she actually ended up meeting me at the botanical garden and shooting the video for the interview. It was so nice that this stranger, I mean, this plant friend I had known on Instagram for a while, was so generous. She showed up. We got a tour of the garden together. She was amazing and so sweet. So go follow her, Channy Gray Home, if you don't already. All right, my Southwestern desert dwellers, let's dive into it. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully. 
just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend, go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's No Small Endeavor. Tina, welcome to Bloominger Radio. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Arizona. Yes, thank you for managing my <laughs> chaos. I reached out to your your team, you know, yesterday, I think in 24 hours, we pulled this interview together, but it feels, I can't believe I'm pinching myself that I get to come to the Desert Botanical Garden and not only here be here, but talk to the Director of Horticulture. You are here. Let's do it. Let's do it. So um, <laughs> can you give us an introduction to your story on how you became the Director of Horticulture at the DBG? Sure, sure. So I started my horticulture career in in Lexington, Kentucky. Okay. And then I went into um, education for horticulture. I really wanted to be a mad scientist, mm. but then I got bit by that education bug and I really okay. liked getting people excited about horticulture, what they could do in their yard, what was happening with their plants. So I stayed on that route for a while. And then I was in South Florida and I did some formal teaching and then I worked in the industry for a little bit. And then we moved to Arizona and I thought, you know, I love botanical gardens. They have a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. So I landed at the botanical garden in 2005 and here I am and have been for quite a while. So I always like to say I started with maple trees, went to palm trees and now my cactus. Right. Now you're living that saguaro <laughs> life, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How was that transition for you? I mean, it's pretty much you had to learn an entirely different new set of species of plants really transitioning you do. to Arizona, right? You do. But you know, the thing is when you have a horticulture background, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what questions to ask, or you're like, okay, let me figure out how that works because I know what it's supposed to be, but mm -hmm. let me put it in a desert environment. And a lot of it is like, huh, that's right. pretty cool. Wow, <laughs> that's so interesting. And what is being the director of horticulture mean? What What is your day-to-day -day annual yeah. experience here? So the scope of work my team is responsible for. So of course, we want to make the garden gorgeous and beautiful. So when our visitors come, they're just blown over by what they see. So that's, that's one team. Mm -hmm. Then we also have what we call Desert Landscape School, which is part of our public horticulture, because a lot of times people are like, I love these plants, but I don't know how to grow them. Yeah. So we have public horticulture in our school. The third part is, you know, it's kind of that operations. You mm -hmm. have to have the irrigation. You have to have the groundskeeping. You have to have the project management. Mm -hmm. You have to have the people that know how to drive forklifts and, and do all that big stuff. So that's another team. And then the last team we have is what we call living collections. Okay. So you need to think about the garden as a living museum. Mm -hmm. And instead of having an art collection, we have a plant collection. And we have the nationally accredited collections for agave and for cactus. So if you guys, anybody wants to know about cactus and agave, they start with Desert Botanical Garden. So our living collections, we hold in greenhouses, shade houses, and not mm -hmm. just the living part, but we do seeds and DNA and images and all kinds of stuff. So living collections is a big part of what this garden does. And that's what we're going to take me behind the scenes to go see later today. Yeah, we are. I'm going to take you into our new greenhouses so you can see some of our plants and our cactus that we keep in those environments. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> All right. So go follow me on Instagram to make sure that you can see the, the little behind the scenes snippets yes. you're going to give me. I think that is so cool. I've, I'm recently very curious about agave because I like the spiritual aspect of agaves, how mm -hmm. they put off pups, they die back, you get a new life. I think that's very mm -hmm. cool. I'm going through a similar experience right now with my business and I don't know anything about them. So, mm -hmm. you know, as a New Yorker, it's interesting. Number one, you've done your job. You've nailed the wow factor walking here. Good, good. And something that I've always felt about, I've worked in Tucson several times when I used to be a traveling performer. Mm -hmm. And the thing that blows me away about Arizona and this area of the country as someone who's grown up in New York in completely different vegetation mm -hmm. is in one country how varied all of our landscapes can be. And, you know, we've got our grass and our mountains and our, you know, decidu our, you know, evergreens, right. deciduous yep. trees mm -hmm. in on the East Coast. Yeah. Then you go to California and it's not this desert, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a different style mm -hmm. of desert. You're in Arizona. I feel like when I'm in Arizona, all I do is worry about like, where is my water? Like, am I, am I hydrated enough? You know, I feel like so nervous mm -hmm. here. 
My parents just moved to Florida. That's completely tropical. Mm -hmm. So that is something as I've continued in my journey as a plant parent that I've become more aware of is just how different Mm -hmm. our country is and how many different plants there are. Yeah, And how wonderful is that, that no matter where you travel or whatever other botanical garden you might go to, you're introduced to a whole other set of plant or another plant palette that you may not be used to. So I I hear a lot of times when people come to this botanical garden or even to Arizona, Mm -hmm. they're like, I feel like I'm walking on another planet it or visiting like another planet. So even though I see green things that I know are plants, yeah. they don't look like the plants I know. And I'm not quite sure where I am, but they love that feeling of yeah. you just kind of threw me off, but I want to know more and, and let me see what else you have. Totally. Mm-hmm. And like the colors are different mm-hmm. and it's just a different vibe. And also something that's really taken me aback is observing kind of the whole ecosystem. Mm-hmm. We've been walking on the property of the hotel that we're staying at. And this morning, we noticed that all the woodpeckers were in the holes of the agave, sorry, the saguaro Mm -hmm. and all the amazing hummingbirds that you have down here. And it's just a totally different experience. And it's it's just so, I mean, it's so cool. So let's talk about desert. I'm I'm excited. I'm a full-time novice in in what we're going to talk about today. Desert landscaping. Okay. Different beast than what most of us know with our grasses, you know, whether or not to mow the lawn. Right. So let's zoom out for a minute and define what a desert is first. Oh, one of my favorite things to talk yeah? about. Okay. okay. And that's also a best place to start because yeah. that's what we also tell people who are new to the area. Mm-hmm. First, let's figure out where you're living yes. because then, then you'll know what you need to operate in. Totally. So when we talk about the desert and Phoenix is the Sonoran desert, part mm-hmm. of the Sonoran desert. But anytime you define a desert, it's got three characteristics. Okay. So one of them, it usually gets less than 10 inches of precipitation a year. Wild. You get ex- temperature extremes. So when I say that, I mean, it can be whether winter or summer, but it could be a 30 degree difference in a 24 hour period. Mm-hmm. And then the other part is we have a really high rate of evaporation. So if you think about for a whole year, we might get less than 10 inches of rain, but when we do get it, it's not going to last long. Mm-hmm. So we have to be able to grab it and use it. And when I say we, I'm speaking for the plants. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the three big limiting factors of a desert that that you have to work in. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing about living in a desert and you work with native plants or desert adapted plants, Mm -hmm. they know how to do it. Yeah, totally. We're not, we don't need to show them or do anything or give them extra care, you know, or really coddle them. Yeah. They know what they're doing and we can learn from them. Especially with desert plants, because I feel like we see that in the houseplant community a lot is you over love your plants, you over coddle your plants. And I would assume, I mean, I think a lot of people actually on the houseplant side, they try and take care of a succulent, they overwater it, it dies, and then they say, I'm a, I'm a plant killer, I can't keep anything alive. And I'm like, no, you're not a plant killer, but you put that succulent in your dark bathroom with no natural light mm-hmm. and you watered it every day. Mm-hmm. Like you, what, if you put a, you know, prayer plant there, it would probably be fine, you right. know? So it is really interesting having to really understand the nature of where you are in order to pick those right plants, you know? Exactly, exactly. Because a lot of times we'll have people call us and say, can you help me? I just killed all of my landscape plants. And the first thing we ask them are, what kind of plants do you have? Yeah. And then how often are you watering them? And usually they are watering them way Mm -hmm. too often because it's hot. We better give them some extra love. And we do that by giving them more water. And and our plants are not designed. I know. It's so sad. Yeah, yeah. And I feel for the, and I'm excited to talk to you about outdoor primarily, because Mm -hmm. when you install a landscape, that's a multi-thousand dollar investment. That's a huge investment. And we had, I asked listeners for questions for you. And one of them wrote in saying, I just installed my whole landscape and it all died and I need help. So I think with landscape, the stakes are totally higher. And I think the vibe, this Southwestern aesthetic of Mm -hmm. a beautiful kind of grassless cacti garden in your front yard can be so appealing, but you have to know how to do it correctly. So before we dive into the how-to also, thank you for the desert definition, but also we're talking about the Southwest kind of today. What gardening zones are we really kind of honing in on? So, you know, it's a little different. I usually say between nine and 11, Mm -hmm. but if you travel further North in Arizona, then you get into the mountains. Right. And so then you definitely go lower. 
So for me, when you say Southwest, I'm really sticking to more of those high temperature okay. desert areas, low desert areas. Yeah. So, so I'll say nine, between nine and 11. Okay. And actually for those, we have to give a shout out to the Bloom and Grow copywriter is actually a girl, Tina, and her company is called Elevated Gardening and she's in Northern Arizona and she has a specific garden install company based on how to specifically do this weird high altitude Arizona and high garden. desert. <laughs> yeah. High desert. It's like a whole beast in its own. It is. It is. So you guys can go to Tina for that. And we're going to stick to the Southwest nine through 11. Mm -hmm. So where do we begin? What are the unique challenges? I mean, you kind of outlined it with the mm -hmm. desert, but when I'm a beginner, I just mm -hmm. moved from New York to Arizona. I've got a house I'm landscaping. What are the challenges that I should be evaluating when kind of assessing what I should be putting in? Yeah. So what I think when you, the first thing you do is we like to evaluate your yard or your landscape or what area you want to put a landscape in. A lot of that has to do with microclimates. Um, it could be shade that you're getting from another yard. It could be where you have, when we do get rain, you mm -hmm. could have some flooding in that area. Mm -hmm. Because the one thing, if, if anybody walks away from the garden saying anything, we want you to go right plant in the right location, mm, okay. right plant, right Preach. place. Yeah. <laughs> so in order to do that, because that's just going to have your, that's just going to be your success the whole way through. If you yeah. pick the right plant in the right location. So really take the time to evaluate your yard. Mm -hmm. What is it you have going on? And you, it will change from season to season. So I don't say you have to wait a whole year, yeah. but really get to know what your yard is doing, whether it's a windstorm, do you get microbursts? When you do get rain, do you get flooding? Do you have shade coming in from other people's trees or mm -hmm. yards? Mm -hmm. All that kind of stuff. Do you have a pool? What do you have reflective light? Do you have one of those cinder block walls that we all have that will give that will radiate heat as well, too? Mm -hmm. So really knowing those factors about where you want to landscape will then start helping you navigate what your plant palette should be. Because a lot of times people are just like, I like that plant, that plant, that plant, and I want to put them all here. And you're like, yeah, no, no, hang on, yeah, hang yeah, on. Yeah. Right place, right location. And then once you have your plant palette, you know what your location is, you know what, what you're working with, and then you can really go through and pick out the correct plants. Mm -hmm. And that's why we always like to encourage people to use desert plants, mm -hmm. native plants, mm -hmm. or desert adapted. Because we are a low water, mm -hmm. because we're the desert, we don't want people to actually, you know, let's turn on our irrigation and let's flood everything for, you know, every day for two and three hours. That's just, it's not no. responsible. Yeah. Totally. And so, and I think the other thing we like to, to really encourage people is to think about having a desert garden doesn't mean it doesn't have to be lush. So, yeah. as, so as we were walking over here, a desert garden just isn't cactus. We totally. have trees, we have shrubs, we have bulbs, we have grasses, mm -hmm. we have succulents. And then we have, you know, more of those like the cactus and the agave and the yuccas mm -hmm. that people think of. Right. So you really can have a beautiful lush garden in the desert. We mm -hmm. just have to think about it in a different way than what you might be used to. Totally. It's totally lush here. Yeah. I love that. It doesn't, I love that, what you just mm -hmm. said. So let's talk about light because- I feel like the sun is brighter here. <laughs> I feel like I'm burning easier here. I went for a walk for 30 mm -hmm. minutes today and I'm mm -hmm. sunburned. So what is it about the Southwestern sun yeah. that makes it a lot harder? And you're going to, because I would assume that you're going to burn, like it, burning your plants is going to be something you have to worry about a little bit more. And not unless you're using native plants. And desert adapted Fair. plants okay, okay. because they know. Now, let me say this though. So let's say you're redoing your yard and you want to put some new cactus in, some mm -hmm. succulents. What we really want you to do is when you go to your nursery, mm -hmm. the nursery should, lo should have, let me say this, should mark the container which way the cactus has been facing as it's growing. We want to know oh. what the northern exposure is. So when you buy that new cactus and you see a big N or an X on the pot, you know that's north. So when you put it in the ground, you want to face it north because then it's acclimated for that sun. Oh, interesting. So, yes. Okay. So that helps protect it from sunburn. So you want to put it in the same rotation or the same direction that it was grown in, and then you'll ha it'll acclimate just fine. Now, if you have a nursery plant that has not told you the direction it's grown, mm -hmm. you could experience, or not you, the plant could experience sunburn. So a lot of times when we put new plants in, whether mm -hmm. they're you know, because they're new, they mm -hmm. still need a little bit of extra care that we do put shade cloth over some of our plants just to help it protect through that first summer. Okay. Shade cloth. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about shade cloth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. So 
in our garden, we have not just Sonoran Desert, but plants from all deserts around the world. Okay. So, and just because it's a desert doesn't mean it's acclimated to the Sonoran Desert mm. and that light that mm. we can get. So a lot of times when you're walking through our garden, you'll see a lot of shade cloth that we've put over cactus or agaves. And we, a lot of times people will go, what is that? And why do you do that? Mm. And believe it or not, it's, it's sun protection because they're just not acclimated to being where they are. Like I said, right place, right location. We do that in the garden, but it's sometimes we might lose the shade. So during our summer storms, storms like our monsoons, we mm -hmm. might lose a lot of the big trees that were providing that filtered shade oh, interesting. that okay. some of our agaves needed. And then we're going to have to protect them until we can get another shade plant in there to help them. So it's a little bit of, you know, depending on where you are in the garden, what you see and what the plant palette is. But mm -hmm. we do like to supplement with some of the plants. What do you mean when you say plant palette? Plant palettes. So what are you going to put in your garden? What are you going to put in your yard? Well, mm -hmm. let's develop a plant palette. And what I mean by that is if you think like a paint palette, mm -hmm. you have all the colors and you have all the different things you want to, mm -hmm. to choose from. Will you do that with a plant when you're putting a design together? Let's talk about what trees do you want? Do you want shrubs? Do you want perennials? Do you want color? Okay. Um, what height do you want? So you put together this package or this um, menu of plants that you're going to work from to actually put into your yard. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So I think you brought up something really important about water conservation and about not flooding your gardens, because I think we're really looking at unprecedented times with the water crisis in multiple states and the, I mean, world, not just the states. We have international listeners here. So I think water conservation is going to be a much larger part of the conversation as we move forward. So can we talk about, I mean, what everyone's talking about water conservation, but what, what do we need to know about it? Yeah. So let's talk about that yeah. when it comes to your landscape. Yeah. So if you talk about your landscape you or your water use at home, 70% mm -hmm. of the water you use at home is usually because of your landscape. Right. 70%. 70%. Is and your you, irrigation for your landscape. Yeah. Is, wow. is what you're using for your landscape. Okay. So when you're talking about being in a Southwest state, because we are experiencing water mm -hmm. um, restrictions, drought, and I think it's just as we move along each year, yeah. it's just going to be a little bit more. So what we want to encourage people is to really think about how you could reduce the amount of that water you use, but still have that lush landscape. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time educating and giving people resources on how, how do I do that? Well, let, let us show you how. We'd love to show you. You know, plant friends, we take so much time thinking about the quality soil that we put our plants in. But what about our soil, for lack of a better word? You know, we spend like a third of our life in bed, and sleep is foundational for optimum health, so doesn't it make sense to have bedding that reflects that? If this resonates with you, you have to try Cozy Earth Bamboo Sheet Sets. They were named one of Oprah's favorite things in 2018. Cozy Earth's best-selling bamboo sheet set is temperature-regulating and unbelievably soft. Plant friends, Billy and I have been sleeping on Cozy Earth sheets for the last two months, and we will never go back. I am not going to lie, plant friends. I am a sweaty sleeper. It's not cute. I run hot. I run sweaty. And it drives Billy nuts and not in a good way. And when I say that these sheets not only feel like pure silk on your skin, they feel so luxurious, but they are truly cooling to touch. I'm not lying, but they are truly cooling to touch. It's hard to explain it without just feeling it. But when you get in these sheets, they feel cooling. I totally believe that they're temperature regulating. I've experienced it. So the bamboo sheet set is made from 100% premium viscose from bamboo and is temperature regulating. They are the softest sheets either of us have ever slept on. They're literally nicer than any hotel sheets we've ever tried. We liked the sheets so much so that we actually bought a second pair. So because they're our partner, Cozy Earth gifted me our first set, which I had to test out before you know, making these ads, but we loved the sheets so much. We never wanted to change the sheets on our bed because we didn't want to go to our other sheets. So I actually bought a second set of sheets because we really truly feel like we can't go back to our old cotton sheets now that we're in this luxe bamboo set. Totally worth it. Plus, Cozy Earth has a lengthy warranty and everything you need for bedding above sheets. So they have luxury pillows, luxury sheets, luxury blankets, and they even have pajamas and a clothing line for men and women. And plant friends, this is insane, but Cozy Earth is offering you 35% off site-wide when you go to CozyEarth.com and use code GROWINGJOY at checkout. So once again, 35% off when you use code GROWINGJOY at checkout. 
at CozyEarth.com. There is nothing like snacking on fresh picked berries right off the vine or right off the plant. So why not just grow them in your garden so you don't have to go and buy them in plastic boxes at the grocery store? If you're thinking about growing berries this year, you've got to check out Territorial Seed Company. They have a wide selection of berries available this year. So you pre-order now before they sell out, and then they will ship you the berries in the spring when they're ready. So one of Territorial Seed Company's favorite new varieties they wanted me to tell you about is the Double Gold Raspberries. Gold raspberries, doesn't that sound amazing? The berry is disease-resistant. It's ever-bearing, producing two crops of delicious, beautiful, Coral-colored berries each year. Coral raspberries. That sounds amazing. For container gardeners, they like to recommend their dwarf mulberry, which is also everbearing, or their red candy lingonberry with delicious heavy fruit. Both of those ship at the one-year mark, and they have growing instructions included with the plant. I'm getting really into healing through food if you've listened to our herbalism episode, so I love that they have goji berries on their website as well. They also have blackberries that are recommended for raised beds and blueberries that work well planted directly in the ground. Whether you're looking for berries, flowers, or edible plants in either seed or seedling form, Territorial Seed Company has your back. I love everything I've gotten from them so far. And they're offering our community 10% off anything on the website. So go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy and you'll get a 10% discount at checkout. So once again, that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy and you'll get a 10% off discount applied at checkout. So one of the big things you can do talking about is your irrigation system. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about irrigation, we really would encourage you at home to put in a smart controller. Okay. Which means it's going to give you data and it knows when to turn off and on if there's rain and it can give you all kinds of things and it can give you different lines, which we'll talk about in a minute. So using a smart controller, but then you're actually going to install drip irrigation. Okay. Which is very different than sprinkler heads yeah. popping up or yeah. those bubblers where you see tons. Because with that drip irrigation, we can run a line right to that plant's root system. It, right. It's down low, mm-hmm. and then it's going to come out at the right amount for the right amount of time because of that smart controller and go right into the root system. Okay. As opposed to me standing out there with a hose at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And 80% of that water is evaporating and never getting to the root system. Totally, totally. So using a smart controller and really thinking about installing drip irrigation Mm -hmm. is a huge step in reducing the amount of um, water you would use in your landscape. Then on top of that, you have the appropriate plant palette. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of low water plants, whether Mm -hmm. they're the trees, shrubs, cactus, agave, yuccas. Yeah. You just put low water plants in, so... I love that. And what about grass? Because I feel like that's the biggest thing, right? Is taking your grass out and putting gravel or putting cacti. So what would that look like? Is that mm. is that a big part of, of what you how you help people? We do. And you know, turf is not, and I say turf or grass, mm-hmm. you know, it's just not a natural plant element. Yeah, yeah totally. But we love it so much, right? Because it's yeah. beautiful and we can walk on it. It's just not sustainable, especially when you live in a state that is in yeah. a desert. Yeah. So we really encourage people not to have grass or turf, or if you're going to have it, can you reduce it maybe what we call a smaller island of it? So the pets do have a place to go out and maybe lay down or Mm -hmm. to do whatever they need to do, or the kids can walk outside and have something soft to walk on. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of having a front yard and a backyard full of turf, maybe you only do it in the backyard and then you reduce it to maybe just a small area Mm -hmm. of it. If you're not quite ready to get rid of all of it. Yeah. The hotel we're staying at, the Marriott in Phoenix, has a golf course, which I know that's a whole different thing for water conservation, but it, they've done a really interesting job of doing mostly landscape, agaves, cacti. And then they have this one where they must be doing all the weddings, but they have this one kind of platform where they've got some grass, but even the grass has pavement. There's mm-hmm. like pavement running through mm-hmm. it. So is there an easy way? Can I ask, like, is it as simple as ripping the grass out and then putting, like, what does that look like? Yeah. So if we're going to go and we start renovating a yard uh-huh. and, you, you know, we're helping someone do that, the first thing we tell them is, and they agree, they've agreed, yeah, I want to get rid of my turf. You can let it die naturally because mm-hmm. a lot of times we have winter and, and summer grasses here and you can mm-hmm. just stop watering it. Oh, right. And okay. then you'd have to come in and definitely it's a lot of work to be able to come and clean it up 
break it out, yeah. shovel it out. Um, there are chemicals that you could use to wipe it all out at once. Okay. Um, and that, you know, I think that's up to each person's preference if they want to use a chemical or not, or just to kind of let it die naturally and mm-hmm. do a lot more of that manual work to, to rip it out. But once you kind of have that baseline, that mm-hmm. almost empty canvas, yeah. then, you know, you're want to you're going to want to take some soil samples to see what kind of soil you're working right. with. You know, right. do I need to amend? And you usually don't have to amend because if you're using desert plants, mm-hmm. this is the soil they like. Right. Now, if it's new construction, you might want to check for compaction because compacted soil is not good for any root system. Yeah. yeah. So things like that. And then um, what you do is you go in and you start putting your plants right right place, right location, right? Right. right. You have your new drip system that you've designed and you're, you're running poly tube or spaghetti tube to each mm-hmm. new plant. Mm-hmm. And then once you're done and everything looks good and you tested it, then you can put a top dressing on it. And that's what you see a lot out here with baby mm-hmm. because it's just rock. Well, what we call top dressing, it's not quite mulch like you see yeah. back east, yeah. but it's it's mulch. And what that does is even though it's rock, it still helps hold moisture in the soil as well, too, and reduces the amount of evaporation. Mm. So, And it just gives it that nice finished look as well. It looks real deserty and beautiful. <laughs> so is it rock? Is it sand? What no, is it's it? rock. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then what is a standard, like... I'm assuming the soil is mostly sandy. I mean, it's not loamy. It's it's sand. I mean, is there it's organic matter in the soil mm-hmm. here? It can't. It is. There's some organic matter. Um, we do a lot of soil profile and testing, and it's it's not the easiest stuff to dig. Um, mm-hmm. I will say, yeah, there, I would bet <laughs> there are times it's all rock that yeah. we actually get out jackhammers. Wow! And then you're like, oh, now I got to put a plant in that. Right. But again, the plants are used to it. So, and I don't want to call it compacted soil, but is what happens out here, we have what we call caliche, mm-hmm. and it's this layer of the calcium that mm-hmm. builds up and it almost becomes like cement. Okay. And you can't, you hit it with a shovel and all of a sudden your whole body's oh, vibrating no. and okay. that's when you have to get out the jackhammers. Okay. So soil is not the prettiest out here that you just want to roll in and yeah. plant everything. It's yeah. going to take a commitment to start digging some holes. <laughs> okay. So it's, you're probably, this isn't maybe a DIY situation. You're probably going to need some support. You're going to need some help probably. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I would, I would encourage that. Or maybe, you know, take your time and do it over the winter when it's not 112 mm. and you're out there digging holes, Clever. which we wouldn't be planting in that right. time anyways, but. Totally. But at least yeah. you could prep the garden before before it warms up to plant. Yeah, do some site. Yeah. And usually we don't plant in the summer just mm-hmm. because it is hot. So our planting times are the fall, mm-hmm. October, November. And then we can actually plant January, February, maybe March. And then we cut off any kind of new planting oh, just because I'm of that. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm under snow, <laughs> under 10, 10 inches of snow from like November through May. So let's talk about native desert plants, okay? Because those are the plants that people are looking for. Mm-hmm. What, why are, why and how are they so savvy? How are they adapted to thrive in the desert? There are so many plant adaptations for living in the desert. Mm-hmm. We could spend a whole hour, yeah, talking about. Okay. I could walk you through the garden and talk about and point out all these different plants. Yeah, let me tell you how this is working. Right. So some of the really cool ones that I love to share with Uh people, and I think the ones that capture people's when they first walk in the garden and and captures their imagination are like, what is that? So first, let's talk about a cactus. And that's a succulent. Mm -hmm. And that means a plant can store water for large amounts of water for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So if it's not raining, the root system isn't getting getting the water, it can use what it has. So it's it's really amazing to think of those saguaros. And if you look, they look like they have ribs or pleats. And the mm-hmm. whole reason they do that is so that they can expand to hold water mm-hmm. and then they can contract when they're using it. So it allows that stem to move as it's capturing water. And that way the stem doesn't, you know, explode. So, so that's cool. I know. I wish we could see it in, in um, time yeah. lapse so you uh-huh. can see the cactus. So that's a great one. The other one, and I love this, and this might be urban legend, but supposedly we've had people walk in the garden in March. Mm-hmm. They love our beautiful Palo Verde trees with the bright yellow, but they have green bark. And that's so cool. And we've had people walk in in March and they go, did you guys paint your trees for St. Patrick's Day? Oh my yeah. gosh. Or like almost the first time I saw it a couple of days ago, I was like, oh, I wonder if that tree is sick. <laughs> is it mold? Like right? what's up with that tree? Why is it green? It's yeah. so cool. It's, it's, yeah. And they're the most spectacular. So you put that bright, vibrant lime green mm-hmm. with those yellow blooms. And it is just one of the most stunning. Um, I always say we compare it to the cherry blossoms back 
but we have the Palo Verdes. But the reason that bark is green mm -hmm. is because it has chlorophyll, which means it can do photosynthesis, which means it makes food. Oh, so, so the bark itself can photosynthesize. Yes. So when you have those trees, one of the things that it'll do is drop its leaves to conserve water because it doesn't want to lose water mm -hmm. through transpiration. So in order to do that, it still needs to make food. So if it doesn't have the leaves that are, that are you know, transpiring and being able to, to do photosynthesis, then the bark on the tree is able to supplement and still keep that tree alive. That is so cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What are their root systems look like? So let's walk that through. So if we, if we only get maybe seven to 10 inches, we might get maybe, you know, a 16th of an inch at a time, or I know I always have to do millimeters because yeah. that's just when you talk science, where should the root system be in order to get that water before it evaporates? Yeah. So we have really shallow root systems that are just right below the soil surface. So when that, those water molecules hit, mm -hmm. those root systems can grab it right mm -hmm. away and be able to use it. So a lot of shallow root systems. That's why when you're at the garden, we ask people to stay on the trails because you really don't realize you're walking on a root system mm. and that could damage the plant, you know, from the potential the plant has to get water. So how does a big saguaro mm -hmm. stay upright? Like all of these euphorbia and the really tall, I saw my first boob cactus in real life. What's the boob cactus? Mammillaria. Oh, the mammillaria. The one that yep. looks like mm -hmm. it has boobs. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's what its nickname is on the internet. <laughs> I didn't realize that, but it makes sense when you say mammillaria. Yeah. So they're so tall. So if they have these shallow root systems and they don't have a tap root, how do they stay up erect? Or they're uptight? extensive. They're extensive okay. root systems. And they can have a little bit of a tap root, but it's not typ a typical tap root that you think of on maybe on some of our trees. Mm -hmm. So if you walk by one of our saguaros next time or when we're out in the garden, think about how tall that saguaro is. Uh -huh. And if it came down, that's how far out the root oh, system wow. would go. Okay. And so the roots... Are they like trees where, you know, the roots will intertangle with other saguaros and other plants mm -hmm. and there's a lot of underground negotiating happening? Mm -hmm. there? there is a lot going okay. on underneath, a lot. So it's amazing. So, you know, I always think of like palm trees in Florida during a hurricane mm -hmm. and how they're built just to go with the wind. Yeah. Same thing here. Those saguaros, very rarely do we have saguaros follow if they've been planted correctly yeah. and watered correctly. Yeah. Very rarely do we have tons of saguaros that come down because of a windstorm or our monsoon seasons. Interesting. It's, it, they come down that. when they've been overwatered. I bet. Because then the roots, no, right. the root system's like, why do I have to grow and become sturdy? Because I'm getting water right here. Interesting. So the lack of water triggers them to keep looking for water and growing and expanding. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. We talked a lot about irrigation. My only other question, do you, uh, are people really into rainwater barrels here? Yeah, so water harvesting is a really big topic mm -hmm. as well. And we like to teach that. So not only let's talk about drip irrigation and using traditional irrigation, but how can we take advantage of our two rainy seasons? That's yeah. one of the most unique things. One of the is one of the most unique things about the Sonoran Desert is we get two rainy seasons. And mm -hmm. that's why we have such a biodiverse desert compared to other deserts. Mm -hmm. So we get those summer monsoons with that really hard rain and a lot of it that comes down so we can capture that. And then in the winter, we get what we call those nice gentle rains. And that's a second opportunity to collect. Okay. So even if you and I are going to go for a walk later, you're going to see on our greenhouses, we actually have... Um, harvesting. So when the rain hits the greenhouse, it goes through the gutter and then we fill up our cisterns. So we are mm. able to use that and supplement any kind of watering. Yeah. So that's a lot. And we like to encourage people to think about that as a, as a resource for their home as well. Yeah. It almost is like you guys have to become like the plants. You have to get really savvy. You mm -hmm. can't take rain for granted the way I do where no. it rains like every day where I live. Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. So drought tolerant plants mm -hmm. the conversation. Everybody wants to talk about right now. <laughs> right. So let's talk about what your favorite drought tolerant plants are okay. or low water plants. Sure. What would you recommend people trying? Oh, you know, that is tough. You're talking to right. a horticulture plant girl right. who's been in the desert for about 15 years yeah. now. And I learn new plants every time. Don't get me wrong. Uh -huh. It's it's just amazing. So I'm just going to give you a few that yeah. I really like to lean into that usually are part of my base plant palette. Okay. Not only because they're low water or drought resistant, but there's just something about that aesthetic that I love to use, whether it's next to a boulder or in a grouping or mm. just anything. So my first one is a shrub that I love and it's, and I love it because it's just this 
beautiful evergreen. Mm-hmm. So to almost, and I hate to use the word tropical in the right. desert, but it gives you it that gives constant you that vibe. green and that vibe. Yeah. So do you want, do you want the common name or the Latin name? Both, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the lat- so the common name is a hot bush. Okay. And it's beautiful if you're trying to make a hedge or if you're trying to do a screening or you just want a little bit more of that lushness in your garden. Mm-hmm. So it's the hot bush or the Latin name or the scientific name is Dodonia viscosa. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, viscosa. Okay. And then that's the shrub I love. And when, it, and I'm an agave girl as well, too, mm-hmm. just because they're, oh, they're just gorgeous and so many different hybrids yeah. as well. But the agave Victoria. <laughs> My so middle name is Victoria. <laughs> okay. So it's a nice, it's, a, it's not a huge one, you know, that gets taller than you are, but it's just this compact, but it's kind of got that variegated, beautiful dark green with, uh, with white lines along the margin. Mm. Oh, it's just, I love the shape of that, that rosette. And then, you know, when it comes to trees, I have to throw out, I just love the Palo Verdes. Yeah. Because of that lime green bark or the ironwoods that we have. Okay. Which What's have, an iron one? ironwood? And I'm going to send it to you because okay. I never pronounced the Latin correctly. But you're looking at one right there, that big, tall tree. Oh, and yeah. in the springtime, it gets the most beautiful pink flowers on it. Ooh. It's just amazing. Okay. And of course, I have to give you our icon, the saguaro. Yeah, I mean, duh. the carnagia, yeah, gigantia. Yeah. So that's holy moly is it, you know, once we get up close to one and you look at it, you're just like, this is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. It truly, they have a spirit. They have a energy Mm -hmm. about them that is so magical. It is. And I was, you know, like I said, this morning walking and we were noticing just all these holes with all the birds living in them. And it's just like so poetic and beautiful. Yeah. You know what we call those? The cactus hotels. <laughs> so, That's amazing. So with the saguaros, you can have the Gila woodpeckers that will, will yeah. put the holes in, but it doesn't damage the saguaro. Because we get a lot of those questions like, uh-huh. aren't they ruining the saguaro? Oh, interesting. No, no, they're not because they can form a scab in between, mm-hmm. you know, inside in that tissue. And that's where all the different kinds of birds and animals that live. So it's you incredible. can walk through and sometimes you can see an actual saguaro hotel with an owl and a woodpecker. And a, yeah. I mean, it's just. It's what about um, pollinators, native Ooh. pollinators here? Because I'm a hummingbird. I'm a obsessed in a weird way with hummingbirds because <laughs> we have them in my house up there. They're like my, my hummingbirds mm-hmm. are my best friends. So let's talk. Uh, do you have favorite blooming plants for attracting other pollinators? Yeah. So we're really big on pollinators mm-hmm. here. And there's a couple of different reasons why. First of all, our saguaros and a lot of our cactus bloom at night. Yeah. So we're really into the night pollinators, mm-hmm. which could be anything from a bird coming out at dusk, or it could be the moths, or mm-hmm. it could be the bats, which I, was I think say, do you have bats here. Yeah. We do. And so not so many of our saguaros this far mm-hmm. are, are pollinated by bats. Mm-hmm. But it can, it can happen. And then, of course, during the day, you have all the bees and the hummingbirds. Mm-hmm. And I love looking at a plant and looking at the shape of the flower to try to figure out mm-hmm. what the pollinator is. I mean, yeah. it's just one of my most favorite puzzles ever. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're really big into pollinators. We do a lot of native milkweed here. Okay. Because we like to provide for the monarchs, those way stations. Yeah. And to be able to help during migration to make sure they have that food. So native milkweed is something we always promote mm-hmm. as part of a plant palette. Mm-hmm. And during our plant sales, because the horticulture department likes to. And they can come to your plant sale. Tell us about the plant sale that you guys have. Yeah. So talking about redoing your yard or making mm-hmm. sure you have a, a lush desert yard, you're like, okay, this is great. But where do I find these plants? Mm. Well, check your botanical gardens, but like here at Desert Botanical Garden, we offer a plant sale twice a year. And what we do is really try to put out the plants that you normally wouldn't find at maybe some of your other locations. Yeah. Because we want you to have those native plants, desert adapted and locally grown plants. Mm. So always come out, take a look. And then you're just like, what is this? What is that? And horticulture staff actually staffs the plant sale. Cool. So, so you, you have that resource and you have great conversations. You can talk about how many irrigation lines I need. Yeah. What should I put on this? Is this a bare root? So lots of great conversations and it's great learning experience as well. Yeah, I think in general, my experience with botanical gardens, because I have a great relationship with New York Botanical Mm -hmm. Garden, I think people don't take advantage of their botanical gardens as much because they're rooted, the botanical gardens rooted, for lack of a better word, in education and service Mm -hmm. more beyond your local plant shop, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're doing so much stuff to give back to the environment in addition to just selling plants is like a tiny part of what you guys do. And it just blows me away with the NYBG, like how much they do for the community and how much they, how much education they provide and the classes. 
So tell me, so this has been like a great 101 kind of desert landscaping, but you guys just launched an online desert landscaping course, right? So if people are interested, where where can they maybe yeah. come by that course from you guys? Yeah, so in the vein of botanical gardens being a great resource for no matter where you live in yeah. the country, yeah. always check, start with your botanical, start there, start yeah. with your botanical garden. We have what we call as part of our public horticulture division is Desert Landscape School. Okay. And it's a certificate-based school. But then we started thinking, not everybody wants to take a class yeah. to get a certificate. So if you're already in the industry or you want career training, these are the best classes for mm -hmm. you. But we were missing a lot of opportunities to educate the public, new people that came in. Mm -hmm. What can we do for you? So what we ended up creating was the Desert Landscape School Hub. Okay. And what that is, is a hub of information. Okay. So you can take micro courses, you can download growing guides, you can look at how to videos like, well, how do I water this? When do I water? Yeah. How long do I water? Yeah. We'll check out all these different offerings we have in the hub and that will help you get started. And if you get hooked and you're so into this, then sign up for a class right. with us and you can either come on site or you can take online courses. And then if you're like, this is it, I need to know everything you guys know, then sign up for the, for certificate, the certificate courses. So we really try to offer a really broad menu of resources and materials. Yeah. So you can start at the entry level you're comfortable with yeah. and then just take it and run with it. That's so smart. Yeah, because a lot of people start, I mean, a lot of people get into Plant Parenthood because they buy a house and they got to figure out how to landscape. And yeah. then all of a sudden they're master gardeners, you know, teaching, teaching at the local university, exactly, you know, exactly. so that's awesome. And a lot of our country is this landscape, you know, mm -hmm. so there are people that can't access your specific garden in Phoenix, right. but it's amazing that you have that education. Yeah. We used to have students that would drive from Las Vegas to come down to go to our classes every week. Wow. How and far is that? So that's a, probably a four hour drive to oh Las Vegas. Gosh. And we were so, we we're just so amazed that, that they were coming down because it's again, Las Vegas in the desert. So we really, started talking about well, how can we get this information yeah. out there more accessible and yeah. like you got to put things online and I know people started getting tired of online yeah but we really tried to make it an engaging fun experience and not just scrolling not just reading we put interactive games all kinds of things in yeah. there because we want you to enjoy your time sitting there and learning totally so, yeah I love that. Well, we'll link everything in the show notes for this episode and the blog. I want to wrap up because we're recording this with no air conditioning and we're both starting. <laughs> I am really glistening right now as we record. We did have a couple of listener questions that we got answered, but there's one in particular that I think people in this desert area who want to grow food. When do you recommend trying to grow? Is there a season that you can grow food in this area? Yes, and it's probably the complete opposite of what you thought I know, right? it was. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to do a couple of things for you. So okay. yes, you do. You can grow vegetables and fruits and herbs in yeah the Sonoran Desert. Okay, join the Desert Landscape School Hub. Okay, <laughs> and we actually have a calendar of when to plant your vegetables oh, and amazing. your fruits and for your free? herbs and for yeah oh, absolutely amazing. for free. But I'll the thing it. is, it'll actually tell you. This is the variety that does best in the mm. desert. The other thing is too, you know, not only the calendar, but then it will tell you what varieties to plant. So let's talk about tomatoes, for example. Yeah. I have so many people that go, when do you grow tomatoes? And I'm like, actually, you're going to put them out in February. Right. <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> and I'm then so wrap jealous. it up. The other part is you can also come to the Desert Botanical Garden because we have a whole trail and exhibit dedicated to to um, vegetables and fruits and herbs. So you can walk out and actually see what our horticulturalists have planted, wow. take a look at their calendar, but then you can also see the varieties that they've planted as well. So a couple oh, of different so things cool. we do for you so you can so you can be successful at your vegetable growing. Amazing. Well, this was so interesting. I'm so excited to get out into the garden with you. Even if it's a billion degrees outside, it's gonna be great. We're gonna shoot content. I'm gonna okay. be glistening. I'm gonna be shiny. <laughs> Where can everyone find you and the Desert Botanical Garden? We'll have links in the show notes, mm -hmm. but where can everyone find you guys? DBG.org. DBG.org. Mm -hmm. Everything's there. You guys are on Instagram too. You're on all the socials. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, make your way here, guys. I can't recommend it enough. It is dreamy. And it really does feel like you're stepping into this different land. And the drive here, there are these enormous rock mountains. The buttes. The buttes are like mind blowing. You really feel like you're like on yeah. Mars. It's yeah. wild. Yeah. When you first move here, you're like, are those real? Yeah. Am I? Yeah. Like what? Is this a sci-fi? What's <laughs> happening right now? But thank you so much. This was incredible. And I hope maybe I could convince you to come back on the show maybe in a year, you know, for a check-in. Yeah, that would be fabulous. I've enjoyed it. We should go get our hats before we go outside. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much to Tina for this eye-opening conversation. You know, I've lived only in the Northeast my life. I've never lived in desert, you know, surroundings. I've never lived in the Southwest. It feels, you know, the thing about living in the States and part in this, as I digress for our European and Australian, you know, international listeners, but the thing with the United States that blows my mind is the regions here are so wildly different. The vegetation and the the experience of living in the Southwest is so different than living in the in the Northeast where I live. And so it's really foreign to me. I really don't know that much about these plants. And she was just an incredible resource of information. And the Desert Botanical Garden is an incredible resource, whether you're taking classes, whether you're looking at their website, or if you're in the area, if you get the chance to go and just get knocked over by the historic saguaro that they have and all of the amazing species of pollinators and cacti and plants, it's really just the most magical place. So you can check them out at dbg.org. Thank you, my sweet listeners. I'm just having the most fun post-rebrand, like making all this content for you. It's just been the greatest. Thanks for all of the feedback you've been sending me. And thanks to our sponsors, our amazing sponsors for supporting the show. I couldn't be making these weekly episodes for you without them. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you have incredible weeks. I hope you learned something interesting this week. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm 